Okay, good evening class. Uh, thank you very much for logging in. I know today is a public holiday, but I greatly appreciate the time and effort you've taken to be able to log in. We want to look at our chapter two. It's quite short. Then after we want to look at one practical. We want to see, uh, it's an online tool. We want to do registry analysis in being able to test for one of the components of which we are going to cover today. So today's class, we want to focus on the practical. We want to see how do you test for integrity? Because you remember we said in the last class that every time you present a particular digital forensic case to the magistrate, there's a lot of evidence that is needed. So the kind of evidence that is needed, one of those that is highly important is that of registry analysis. And that's one we want to see because it's one of the major key components. Uh, integrity is one of the components of security. Okay, so we are good to go for this class. We want to focus on the components of a secure system. We look at security, its characteristics, its components. We look at the kinds of attacks, which are the same as vulnerabilities. We will then look at some of the security challenges, um, the taxonomy, what are some of the trends? How did they quantify the amount of loss in within security and some of our core strategies our class is quite short so for stats we want to define computer security this is the protection that is afforded to an automated information system in order to attain application objectives in preserving three things if you would want to even just reduce it into brief this is the protection of any information system to preserve its integrity, availability, and confidentiality of its resources. So if we ask you, give us examples of computer resources, you know them, hardware, software, firmware, information, data, telecom, all these are examples, all of these are examples um, of computer systems or system resources. So, what are we trying to say here? We are focusing on preserving the, we call it CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These are the key core components that make an information uh, system or a secure information system. So the quality of state of being secure or of being in danger, is what we term as um, security. A moment. So we define security as the quality or state of being secure or being free from danger. We can't totally say that one can be extremely out of danger. However, they try. And that's why today we are going to look at security, different layers involved in it, different forms that someone can want to use to ensure that they are having a secure uh, system. So for every successful organization that is security oriented, computer security oriented, we'll need to ensure and put in place all these different six components. We have physical security, personal security, operation security, communication security, network security, information security. And you know, all these are small bits and pieces and types of security. So at any one time, you should know how you define them. Of well, these, our focus is on information security ensuring that the kind of information that an organization has or the assets 
we protect their confidentiality, the integrity and availability of such assets. You'll see if it is physical security, what are you protecting? The physical objects. You want that the area is safe. You don't want them to break into, that is physical security. And you want to see that all anything concerning physical security is well handled. How do we ensure personal security? What is it? It's mine and your security or a group security. A group of people, the moment they have authorized uh, people who are having access to an organization, you need to have mechanisms of tracing who accesses what devices, who accesses what premises, that is personal security. It's not everyone that is allowed to access all facilities or all premises. Operation security, it deals with specific series of activities. Imagine if it's an examination set, you'd want to ensure that the process of handling examinations is secure. If it's a process of teaching the whole process, if it's a process, if it's a bank, the process of depositing and withdrawing money, that would be an operations security. Communication security, ensuring that you protect the media, technology and the content, that one we term it as a communication security. Then E, concerning networks, that is network security and its components, connections. You don't want any cyber hackers to come online. You want to be able to track all that is under network security. Information security, we had seen it. That is where we ensure that all data any information that is saved on this on a particular computer of an organization has its confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And you know, those keywords are going to be defined because those are the key core components that make um, a system secure. And these are part of the things that we test. How secure is a system? As I told you from the beginning, by end of this class, when we are done with these notes, there are only about 30 something slides remaining. Then we will go to look at how do we test for the integrity of a system. I will take you through that. Okay. And of course, when we start our face-to-face -face sessions, uh, we will be able to handle it as well. Okay. Still as part of security, we've seen the key core items here to ensure that the triangle of confidentiality, integrity, and availability are preserved. We have different tools as we will see in within the strategies. Every organization must have a, an, a security policy, whether it is networks, but call it information security policy so that it encompasses all the networks, so call it an ICT security policy, so that it encompasses all these different six forms of security. If you limit it to only uh, information system security, that is a little bit, um, it limits it, yet you would want your policies to be as robust, as big as possible. Once you come up with the policies, what are policies? These are documents that contain the do's and don'ts about what and how a system should run. So it's important that all critical elements in an organization, including the information systems, hardware, software, all these computer resources, networks, everything, transmit information in a secure environment. And so that's why we come up with these policies just to guide people I don't know if you remember some of the policies you used to have at secondary school. Uh, some just time, just before COVID broke out in 2020, uh, we visited, I visited my former school. And you know, as obis and orgies, they were all recalling what was the policy that people used to hate most. 
or people were always traumatized about. <laughs> so every organization sets its policies. How do you access the computer lab? And that's where we said private investigators come in. When you break these policies, it's when the law catches up with you. They all wake up and they want to see that they're doing their work. Awareness is important. We've seen that raising this awareness, put screenshots in all kinds of places. I remember telling you one of the best places is placing it in within um, the places of convenience. As you're washing your hands, you can be able to read on the wall. At least put there a few things, don't congest everything. One or two nuggets. As you walk into offices, put some of the hangings there, some of the policies, just to remind people of what the policies are so that they do not break the law and say, oh, we didn't know this was actually a policy. Carry out trainings, educate them, and of course, provide necessary technology which has clear updates and with the right full paid licensed software. So in within this triangle, it's very important that we are going to look at it in looking at this CIA, because these are the key core concepts that help us to describe that a system is secure. Once we protect its confidentiality, integrity and inviolability, ah, our system is secure. In information security, look at it, it's right here. Um, it's right here at the top. Let me quickly annotate, annotate through. Yes, in information security, look at it, it's here, it is the lens. So the lens from which we view information security is made up of these three components. We have management of information security, network security itself, then of course, data and computer security. A merger of all the three is what we have here. And this is what we term as policies. So the kind of policies you make, as we had said, should be comprehensive, ensure that you have all the management components in it, the network security issues, and also the computer and data security. So this whole um, information system security to see that you're secure, you need to ensure that you've covered all um, these three areas. Here we want to look at some of the key core critical characteristics of information. The value of information comes from the characteristics it possesses. How do we know that um, information is secure? It must be available, but available to who? To only authorized users. If I say, yes, I'm an authorized user to Muele, I should be able to log in and access um, the system. By a show of hands, I would want to just find out how many of us have registered on Muele. I see we are 12 of us in class. I see Teddy. We have Alex, we have a team, Dorothy, Bavirie, Emma, Ekumu. Yes, just put up your hand if you have registered on uh, the LMS. We will check as well and see. Because I told you we have a test to do. We'll have a test, I'll check through and see. It's online. <clears throat> just to see how far we've gone. I see Amos has registered. I will get the names there once you register. Please, I encourage you um, to register. Jonathan, um, please register. General Aaron Mwesiga, <laughs> um, Amos, we have Santrin, Kuichiriza, Caroline, Tuhuera, thank you for logging in. Please, I encourage each of us to log in. So this is a system that is available to us. And that's why we are saying for information, part of the characteristics that information must have is the issue of availability. All our authorized users should be, okay, Aaron, you're asking for a register. Our register today, we didn't arrange it, but I'll still ask us, please put your names, um, 
and your reg numbers in within the chat room, please. So that I will save them from there. Okay, so in availability, it's only authorized users that should have access to those computer systems. Accuracy, if we say information must be accurate, that means information should be free from mistakes and errors such that the expected users are able to have access to this information. Authenticity is another one. The information you have should be authentic. It should be genuine. It should be original. Not something that is fabricated, something that is copy and pasted from somewhere. No, your kind of, of system or information that you have should be very genuine. Confidentiality, we will see. Confidentiality here, your information should be protected from disclosure or exposed to unauthorized individuals. People who, I don't know if, you, if you've ever seen people when they're dealing with secrets, they are very, very careful to ensure that sensitive information is not sent over to another group of people that are not needed. You don't need to disclose information. I'll give an example. If a family has its troubles, its problems, it's confidential to that family. You don't go on the streets and go screaming, oh, our family has problems. Oh, we don't have food today. Kindly come to our help. No, if you're having any issues, issues are very confidential. Do not disclose them anyhow. So our information in any information system for an organization should be protected from disclosure and exposure to an authorized individuals um, or systems. For integrity, in integrity here, we are saying that information has integrity when it keeps as a whole, when it is complete, when it's uncorrupted. You save your information today, you come back tomorrow and we are going to test for it. We will tell you, we are going to take um, a screenshot. It's not a screenshot like, you know, print screenshot or print screen. It takes a shot of the memory and all that you have of your computer. Then we shall just edit and say, okay, delete one thing. You delete it. Then that is how we do test for integrity. So what happens? You come with this software. We will see it's called RegShot on your flash disk. Install it on that machine and you're able to test and see. To what extent is this information different from the information that you had the previous day? So if uh, an, a hacker, an inside person decided to leak information, delete information, it went, it was edited. I tell you, it will fail the integrity check. And it's from the report that we will receive that we will be able to see um, what fails and what works. So integrity is one of those things that the courts of law says information must have this integrity. And that's why we test for integrity. And police wants, the, when you're in court, they want you to test for integrity. Where is the evidence? Did you test for integrity? What is the evidence? Using which tool? What are the qualified tools? So today we look at one tool that helps us to test this integrity. Utility, the utility of information is the quality or state of having value for some purpose at the end. In terms of information should be valuable at the end. It should have a purpose, it should have a reason. I'll give an example. When you do a test, it's valuable. Why? It has a purpose. At the end, it will contribute 40% to your results. When you're reading, when you're attending class, why? There is a purpose. When you're doing exams, there is a purpose. End of the day, when you come for graduation, we don't want your parents to faint. Oh, my student, we paid fees. They never ever came to class or they won a scholarship. Now it was a waste of time. Utility, you want to make sure that the quality of what you have is valuable and it has actually served its rightful purpose. Possession, the possession of information is the quality or the state of ownership 
of control. Who is in charge? Who controls this information? Is it the AR? Is it the lecturer? Look at Moele. That's why we're telling you, go and add to your courses, digital forensic investigation. Our course code is IST3105. Go and add it there. You are apart, actually you, uh, you own it as a student. It's one of the courses. So when you do your papers there, you'll be able to see some of these results so that you actually are able to track and trace and know, okay, at least of this test, I've had this and this and the other. That is possession, someone who owns it. You want to trace the levels of ownership. Okay, so remember again, the key core focus of this chapter is to look at the basics, the uh, basic characteristics of um, the basic key characteristics of an information system. What are the secure components? What are the components that make a system to be secure? If they're to tell you, please come and provide a device. Provide a device to this organization, ABCD. You can go. Go, it's okay, it's charging. Leave it, this is mine. This is mine. Oh, slap you. So that is when we test for all this, but we, the core and the most important is that integrity test. So we want to quickly break down what do we understand by CIA, that is confidentiality, integrity and availability. So we want to start by testing, by looking at what is confidentiality. Confidentiality looks at two core concepts. One, there's data confidentiality and there's privacy. Because remember we said, Information to be confidential, it should not be disclosed to people outside the circle. I gave you an example of a family. You're facing internal problems. Everyone faces their own issues. It's not reasonable for you. Go screaming out loud, oh, we are having this. No added value, non-disclosure of information. Imagine if it's a bank. Do you remember a time when they wanted to disclose and put in the newspapers the account balances for every person in particular banks? Ah, all people were just literally screaming, hey, how is that possible? So what was the issue? Do not dare breach confidentiality. If you release this information, and this one is what they usually test uh, in within uh, networks, this is what confidentiality would help us to test. Non-disclosure. You didn't send emails to strangers or share information that is not for a particular party. You know that those are competitors. And then here you are. Mm, this is mommy. Then you're there competing and telling them, oh, this is the way we do this. When they're competitors, there is no added value. Then we look at privacy, we look at confidentiality from two perspectives, data confidentiality and privacy. Privacy assures that the individual is in control or influence what information is related to them that may be collected and stored and by whom and to whom that information may be disclosed. Exactly issues of non-disclosure. It is private to someone, do not disclose it to other different people. We have seen integrity and we will test for our system's integrity. It covers two terms, data integrity and system integrity. In data integrity, we are, this assures us that information and programs are changed only in a specified and authorized manner. Not everyone is allowed to go and install all kinds of programs on, uh, especially if you're working for an organization System integrity, it assures that the system performs its intended functions in an unpaired manner, free from deliberate or in advent unauthorized manipulation of the system. You don't want to find that, yes, the system was antagonized by some people. That means it has lost its system integrity, having access to some of this unauthorized manipulation not just disclosure now, disclosure, we've seen that is 
um, 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 confidentiality being handled. This one is unauthorized manipulation. You get into a system, delete components, and you go. Who authorized you? What if you're deleting the operating system? What if you're deleting that virus? What if you're deleting very core information? What you're dealing with and breaking at that point is system integrity. And that is one of the first things um, the organization or the police will ask for levels of integrity. Did you carry out the integrity test? That is, what, that is the test we want to cover today. And we've seen the software we are going to use is called Reg Shot, R-E-G-S-H-O-T. It's a free small software. Availability, it assures that systems work promptly and service is not denied to unauthorized users. These three are what will make us have what we term as the Kikoa Secure Components of a System called CIA. For availability, the system should be accessible by the people who are authorized. Give an example. You go to an ATM, you want to withdraw money. You have your ATM card and it's telling you, oh, I don't know, the ATM is not available. They're telling you oh, there's no money today or oh, the system is down. And you're thinking, really, I need some little money from the ATM. That means if it's not available, they will have broken the rule of availability because your system is very clear. You want it to be available for authorized users whenever it's needed. Look at Mueli. As students, it must be available to you anytime. You don't want to log on at 10 p.m. and say, ah, oh, today the system is off. No, such a system will have big challenges because your system should be available to its rightful users, those who are authorized to have access to that information. Components of an information system. These ones we covered even in other courses, really. If they ask you for the components, software, hardware, data, people, procedures, networks, all these are different resources. And see, these are things, look at this slide itself. These are things that the person look at where people are, but the people are part of the information system because we are the ones that carry the usernames and passwords. We are the ones that are able to access or break into systems. We are the ones that can compromise the security of a system. Remember this slide again, we will cover it in the next class, chapter three, where we will be able to see, we will be able to see uh, different gadgets that we handle at the different steps of digital forensics. And we will start off with the acquisition process. And of course, we will look at also software that we use to carry out um, the acquisition of a particular backup and what happens therein. Okay, I'm very keen, please. If you have questions, you can feel free and mute and we ask. Next, we want to look at what makes communication insecure and what are the types of vulnerabilities or what are the types of, yes, what are the types of attacks that any system can face? The first two types of, um, of hackers. We will see we have passive attackers. We also have those that we term as active attackers. Okay, so this snapshot here is just showing us when we break any of these. Um, just look at what the snooper is doing. Really, that what they're just viewing over the software, over the wireless network, is clearly snooping, which is passive attacking. So we have security forms of attacks. Mainly two types, we have the passive attacks and the active. We already start with the passive. Passive is when someone is just snooping, viewing. You stand somewhere on the network, and by the way, it is 
a software that you install that is able to pick for you what everyone is sending. Have you heard of people who, whose phones are always being tapped? They tap people's phones to just tap into your conversation to know what plans are you having? What is your next move? Things like that. So a passive attack attempts to learn or make use of information from the system, but does not affect the system resources. Those are passive attackers. They just learn, they log in, they listen, they hear, they see what your plan is. Then they come back another day to attack. But at that point in time when they're snooping, when they're eavesdropping, when they are monitoring the transmissions, that is what they are doing. That is a passive attack. And their main goal is to just obtain information. What is the next move? Who is planning this? What is this one planning to do? That is what passive attackers would do. Under passive attacks, we have two types of, um, of, of types or two types of passive attacks. One is release of message content. And the other one is traffic analysis. In terms of your own is to just only pick out on traffic for the second one. You just want to realize to just to tap into and know how much traffic is this person receiving and to what extent that is necessary for the opponents. So our two types of passive attacks, one is release of message content. You just read. And when you read, you really read enough to make sure, and of course it's sensitive data, and that is it. Because you're not authorized, and what are you breaking? Confidentiality, no one has told you to please go and start viewing people's back statements. You just log on and your own is to just keep sharing all this kind of sensitive information. That is breach of confidentiality. So a telephone, for example, a telephone conversation, or an electronic email, and a transferred file may contain sensitive data or sensitive or confidential information. However, one would like to prevent the opponent from learning the content of these transmissions. Sorry. So one of the things you need to do is to see how are you testing and trying to preserve the, um, the passive attackers from having access to this unauthorized content. This content is classified. It's like when someone goes to a bank and says, I want to get a loan for ABCD. That is your personal information. You, it is classified, it's only for you. It shouldn't be, it's not public information. So the moment your confidential information becomes, the moment your public info, your private information becomes public, that means, uh, confidentiality will have been broken and under which type the type we've seen is that you're releasing you're releasing a message content which is not in order this is just one this is just one uh, or an illustration that is showing us when you look at Bob, Bob is the boss. And Bob is sending some information to Alice. Maybe the accountant, you know, these attackers focus on money. They're telling you, please make payments of maybe 100 million to a person X for a particular transaction. Or maybe you're making payment um, for internet connection for an organization. So in such a case, Bob will send that kind of information. Look at Drath. Drath is a hacker. He, however, he's a passive hacker. All he's just doing is to just read Snoop. He reads the content of messages that are coming from Bob going to Alice. And he's stressing, OK, so it's around this time that the person is sending this kind of request. Okay, wait, when are you paying salaries? Okay, so the person draft just keeps monitoring. That is exactly a passive attack. You're snooping. The other passive attack type two we've seen is, tra is traffic analysis. 
suppose we have a way of masking the content of a message or other information traffic so that opponents, even if they captured the message, could not extract the information from that message. A common technique of masking content is by encryption. So in traffic analysis, people, uh, and of course it comes from the first type, first being able to look and view it. So sometimes it's okay, you can view it. However, we are saying we can decide, let us encrypt it. Let us encode it such that, no, even if you pick it, it is scrambled. You will need another kind of software to unscramble it. So you will not know which, which software it is. You will not know which program it is. However, I will teach you in digital forensics when we come to file extensions in one of the last um, uh, tutorials we will have where we are able to use software to help us analyze and know what programs do uh, different extensions saved in so that you download the right program and open it. So, Encryption is one of the ways that we help in preventing traffic analysis. Drath again, what's, what Drath does, he observes again. He observes and is able to keep noticing how often the level of frequency, he's tracking the traffic as he's reading. He tracks this kind of information. This is still under passive. They haven't yet carried out any attack, no. All they are breaking is confidentiality here. Information was only for Bob to Alice. Draft somewhere, some strange person was there just also tapping, snooping into their Kabozi. And of course, you'll see traffic analysis can also equally be done. You'll see it in um, network intrusions. There are different software and people, people who log in on a network just to pick traffic and see what is happening. Security attacks classifications. We said there are two types. We have active and passive. We finish passive. And yes, Caroline, go ahead, please. Uh, I have a question. Mm. I wanted to know some of the softwares or tools that they use to get the conversation along the way. Thank you. For network intrusion, those ones you will be able to cover. There is one called, let me just type them here. They are usually the tools that they use for even hacking. The main common ones that they use, there is Trino, T-R-I-N-O-O. -O. There is also, um, they call it Strachenberg, but it's called barbed wire. <laughs> barbed wire. That is the translation in, in Dutch. Then there is also NTF, um, what do we call it? It is called Trivial File Transfer Protocol. Um, that is Trivial. It's one of also the software and of course other, <coughs> There's also TNFK, TNFK. Uh, others have it as TNF2K because it first came out in, it's um, for trivial network. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember the F, but it's still for what? Uh, these are all tools that they use to carry out hacking. And we'll encourage you as you're interested in security to also do some certifications. There are a number of certifications online that teach you. And that's why actually from part of the certifications that I enrolled for, that's why I picked all the practicals. And I said, you know, our students should not only just know theory, they should know practicals to see how do they test? Why should you talk about integrity without knowing how do you test for integrity? So there are so many tools if you go online and you ask what tools do they use to do this and the other, there are several, but these are part of the tools they use to sniff, attack, and even the protocols that they use. And some of these they even use them because they hide the person who's sending that you, they mask the 
the users. They mask the senders. You can't trace, especially if one uses VPN, my God, you'll keep thinking, okay, the attackers are coming from Singapore, coming from China, yet they're right next to do. So active attacks, active attacks attempt to alter system resources or affect their operations. Remember for passive, we say these ones just listen in. They pick traffic, they get to know what so-and-so is saying, and it's based on that that they come up with a plan. How, when should we attack? When should we launch? They involve some modification of the data stream or the creation of false streams. Here they have four different types of active attackers. They are masqueraders. They are those that replay an attack. Then there is modification of messages. Then the worst of all are the denial of services and distributed denial of services. But you see, they start little by little, little by little, moving from snooping the passive, they now move to attacking actively. Okay. Um, Karina is asking, are there possibilities that they get all conversations you make or they target a particular conversation only? Yes, they, Caroline, it's targeted. I'll give you an example. I don't know if you've heard in some relationships where you find the man is suspecting that, ah, my wife is having a third party a third person somewhere. They will go and go to the courts of law, officially get a request to go and pick, tap into the phone of this person because they maybe want to get a divorce with this woman. So they need evidence. So once they give them that, they will go to MTN or Airtel and say, ah, these are my wife's numbers. Look at my marriage certificate. Look at the court order authorizing you to tap. And I tell you, they will tap everything. That is how you find people are able to submit a lot of evidence. So it's true who that happens. But of course, people who do this, you have a reason. If you're tapping information from, I'll give an example. If you're tapping information, if there is any phone call right now <laughs> between Kakwenza and Bobby White, I'm telling you that one has to be tapped thoroughly because as a country, they would want to know what is planning? Are they planning to take people to The Hague? Are they planning to take people about the torture? You know, they have to tap. And they only tap for people who are important. <laughs> Students, unless you're involving yourself in a strike, involving yourself in politics, not everyone really, if you're just always calling, um, calling my family to find out how they're doing, we're asking the maid, how are the kids? Then you don't have anything, you, you're not a threat. But if you have, you pose national security to, an organ, to a company, national security to a, a country, I'm telling you, they'll put you on the red list and they're forever tapping your phone. Yes, Amos, go ahead, please. Uh, Madam, for example, if I want to tap someone's phone, do I need to you, know his number, his email? Like, how do I make Amos, it? Like, Amos, yeah. Amos, it's not you who's authorized because you don't have your own network. It is the uh, network providers. Do you get me, Amos? It yes, is madam. like now if I want to tap um, your information and I say, uh -uh, this one is one of the ring leaders in Noob, for example. Once we trust and say, uh -huh, it is this one. What happens? We got the service provider and I need to know your number. It's the service provider who will tap because they're the ones who are providing that service. Are we together? Yes, it is madam, not, madam. I cannot but, tap it without the authorization. Unless if you're tapping, for example, if it's a network and you want to carry out an intrusion, you want to steal information from an organization. Madam, there is a case where Baya, my friend, is studying from Barara University. Mm. There is a scenario whereby he was able to to see like messages from a friend whereby there is some different, like there is some distance, they are not so near. I want to know how you manage to do that. Did you ask him? I didn't, no, he was bragging around. He didn't tell me, but <laughs> he told me he was able to make it. Okay. 
Yes, someone else has an answer for us. Yes, please go ahead and mute. Is it Amo still? Okay. We can do a little more research and also find out. Yes, Alex, go ahead. Uh, excuse me, Doctor. Uh, and to those service providers, Pardon? And to those service providers vending our privacy by tapping. That's why I told you there has to be a reason. If, if it is security that is tapping into opposition stock, they have a right because it's government. Do you get me? But however, it's yeah. even worse. Let me give you an example. FBI, FBI won't even ask you. They have to tap, they know you're a minister. What are you planning for opposition? Because opposition may not have the power to tap. So it's FBI that may decide to work on their behalf. And so let us also find out what are they planning? Do you get me? And that's how you see the biggest watchdog is the US. They are forever snooping, snooping, snooping everywhere. And that's how they get to hear information that, okay, there's a planned attack in Kampala. Please be on the alert. Have you seen those messages? We saw them before the bomb attacks, but they had already snooped. So now do you see the importance of snooping from a high security perspective? And they don't need to ask, why should they ask Al-Qaeda? Al-Qaeda, why are you planning to attack ISIS? Why are you planning to attack Kampala? What is wrong? We've seen this. The most they can do, you do your passive attacking and inform the country and the country people to be alert. So wherever you go to, that is by law, they have really given themselves, they are the world watch watchdogs. Yes, I must go ahead, please. Doctor, you have said that every call that we make, like the government can hear what we are saying. They have a right they, to. Mm. Yeah, there was this scenario, like when they wanted to kill General Katumba. Don't you think those guys never made cause? Why, 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 why did it, like, why, why was mm -hmm. it different for them? Amos, Amos, that is very hard because you cannot know from which side they wanted to kill him. Do you get but me? Should, but still, they can see the numbers that, like, those no. numbers of those people calling. They cannot. It's very tough. It's very tough on their side, you get me? Yes. It's very tough because who will they track? Mm -hmm. If it is a particular person that we've been, that they've been trending on, and you can't know some of this, you can't know who the killing people are. Do you get me? What if it's inside work? Uh -huh. Have you seen how some of the cases, I really don't know what the truth is. <laughs> Because I know many of, actually we teach so many security students who are working uh, in office of the president. Many of them are uh, ISO, ISO people, but they have to study. And so we have to be very careful as well in what we talk because we have no facts. We want to focus on our what? Security. So allow me to continue, please. So I was saying, okay. we have our snoopers. Um, we also have those, that are active. When you now move from just only viewing and now you move to the next level where you're now an active attacker, that is where now you actually are picking information. Allow me to go ahead to look at our four types of our active attackers. We have the masqueraders. Masqueraders, um, masquerading takes place when one entity pretends to be a different entity. This attack usually includes one of the other forms of attacks, e.g. authentication sequences can be captured or replayed after a valid authentication sequence has been placed, thus enabling an authorized entity with privileges to obtain extra privileges by impersonating as an entity that has those privileges. Masquerading, I'll give you an example. Your phone or someone's phone get stolen. You take long about a month to go and even ask for your SIM card replacement. Do you know how your SIM card will be used to masquerade and dupe people? 
they will call people, oh, someone, do you know so and so? The person is in hospital, they need money. They are masqueraders. It's an active attack. They are actually masquerading that they are genuinely you and you're stuck somewhere. So those are masqueraders. Those are part of the active attackers. And here they're just giving us an illustration of an active attacker. Drath picks someone's call or even picks and gets the username and password, logs on, sends an email to Alice as if it's Bob. And you know, if it's money payment, imagine, Alice will go and say, hey, this is a new, maybe it may be a new supplier. Before you know it, money has been sent to a different account. Thank you, Joy, for you, please. So this kind of masqueraders, um, it's, uh, it's actually a very big crime and it's not, it's not needed. The third, second one, a replays. It involves the passive attacker capturing the data unit. Okay, so in a replay, this involves a passive capture of a data unit and its subsequent retransmission to produce an unauthorized effect. We note here that under IP security, we have a whole lecture on this. This is not necessary because you're not looking at only uh, security. So in a replay, what happens? You pick information and replay it again. Have you ever gone to a particular set of group and you go back and say replay? That is what happens here. In replaying, it's just like when you make a transaction. You made payment to someone maybe of 250,000. You go and just say replay. You will make payments to the same person how many times? Two times. You place again replay. You'll have paid the person three times, yet you're supposed to pay the person only once. So that kind of attack in retransmitting that same information. So if it is information about payment, I'm telling you, it becomes a very big disaster. See what Drath does. He picks on information that Bob sent and Bob sent Alice a message. What does Drath decide to do? Okay, Alice is very loyal. She sends this request. Let me send a second one and just maybe changes and puts there his account. And I'm telling you, if Alice is not clear to go and check with Bob, Bob, did you actually send me a second email? You will find that Drath will have actually collected and he'll just say, no, I think actually these are two different payments. And you find that Alice actually makes a second payment when it's not necessary. I must go ahead. Uh, Madam, I'm seeing Bob and Alice, they are communicating. Mm. So, uh, what if I want to be rough? How do I make that? It's software you post. use to tap in. Which software is that, madam? Check on the chat room. I've already put a number of software people use. Okay. Mm. But even there are many more online. There are many more online that people use to tap in. Some of them are free. Some of them are paid for. Are we together? Okay. The next one is modification. In modifying, it simply means that you just picked a legitimate message. Bob, Bob sent an email to Alice. Drath goes and picks the same legitimate email and just changes something. Before you know it, it can be such a big blunder. For example, a message meaning allow, allow Ronald to read confidential file called accounts. It can be modified to say, allow Shamim to read confidential file accounts. That someone can just get a genuine email like this. Before you know it, the person will go and send emails to, and the person can even use this same email. 
attach even the person's email address. And I'm telling you, before you know it, the person modifies. And I tell you, some of the modifications can be so bad, especially when it comes to banks. Imagine if in your account you have 10 million. They remove one zero at the back. <laughs> Do you know how much you remain with? Only one million. How much has been taken? A whole nine million goes missing because someone has had access to an account and just went and deleted the last zero. That is modifying a particular message on someone's account. And that's why you see for the accounts people, every week, depending on how sensitive, if you're in a general tellers one month, you're just depositing, depositing. One month, you change your password. Never ever be reused. But if you're in credits, you're in loans, one week, because those are hot areas that thieves are always attacking. And it's only one person who's allowed to make those um, changes. Draft picks this information and modifies it and sends to Alice. Alice implements thinking that it's from Bob, yet it was a genuine message. The fourth one we've seen is denial of services. And again, there are tools to carry out deny of services. Go and do a little more research on these tools. This prevents or inhibits the normal use of management or communication or facilities. This attack may have a specific target. For example, one may target Mueli and say, ah, people are studying online. How can we keep Muwele busy? That students, whenever they try to log in, it will not work. It will tell them it's busy, it's busy, it's slow. Such an attack would be a denial of service attack. Another form of service is the disruption of the entire network, either by disabling the network or by overloading it with messages so as to degrade the performance. That is a denial of services. Overloading it, I gave you an example, such that if we now know at any one time Muwele has capacity to allow over 50,000 students to sit, people use software which can generate millions of packets. You forward them to a server, and I tell you, you before you know it, it shuts down a whole service and we shall be able to see how in security they do. They usually quantify all these losses because let me remind you of an example of a denial of service that happened last year towards the end. Do you remember a time when um, Meta, that is Facebook, lost uh, a lot of money? It was not available. I think yes, we're in second year. What happened? I don't know, it was a denial of service. We don't know yet. The investigation hasn't yet come out, but we shall pick it. What happened? People from somewhere were sending millions of packets. And I'm telling you, they jammed up all the servers. It took a lot of time for that organization. For They told us they are going to be offline for six hours. And I don't know if you remember the amount of loss that they were calculating that in six hours, they lost billions and billions of monies. So such attacks jamming people from having access to where to save their information is really, really very tough. And it causes organizations, governments to make lots of losses. But to the hackers, they feel they have gained by keeping people at least, for once they say at least we also manage managed to keep Facebook away. And they are waiting that Facebook will not go back again. The owner, Mark Zuckerberg, with the different directors, will not be the world richest because of just those few hours that they had of loss. Look at what Draft does. Draft now goes ahead, uses software, specific software, to go and destabilize an entire server like Facebook, such that the server is not available. Bob is trying to log on and access the server. 
it's not available. Did you, I don't know, during those days, I don't know if you actually went to WhatsApp. Me, when I saw it, thank God for that group, we had actually already uh, come up with, with another um, link on, on another platform, so we, on Telegram. So we didn't bother. We're like, okay, and that whole evening, I actually, what brought my attention to it? I found now this, this group I had just formed was now very busy. Ah, only to read, I said, okay, maybe students are having a problem. Only to find, oh, Facebook is off. And people were so annoyed. People now have learned to say that, you know, we can have an alternative. And people's minds have really thought to diversify ever since that happened. But what happened? Draft somewhere went and attacked an entire server. Okay, next we'd want to go on to look at these categories. Yes, we've seen them in summary. Active attackers, we need to note, uh, present, present the opposite characteristics of passive attackers. Whereas passive attackers are difficult to detect because for them, all they do, they log in and just listen. It's later that they decide to either modify, either delete or replay or even deny uh, access or services to different people. On the other hand, it's quite difficult to prevent active attackers absolutely because of the wide variety of the potential physical, software and network vulnerabilities. Instead, the goal is to detect these active attackers and to recover from any of these disruptions or delays, delays caused by them. If detection, has a deterrent effect, then it may contribute to prevention. And I hope that you people will be able to use tools to see how do you carry out network intrusion? How do you, what software do you use to carry out uh, this kind of intrusion attacks and detect live, either using firewalls or either using snoots or honeypots to see what are some of these software you can install on a network because our own as security experts are to actually protect our whole information system services and its components from the hackers in any form, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Next, we want to look at how people termed defense in the olden days and what defense is. In the long run, look at the, what you have as very secure for an organization is the white spot. You make sure that yes, your data has to be in stacks, the applications are in stacks, the servers are in stacks, networks are there, physical security policies. So you start from the outside. What helps us to, you move from outside all the way to inside. Just thus, all these are different layers in which they used to protect the system. As time has gone on, they have now made it a little more complex. This is now a defense of the in-depth. Look at how it has now, look at the middle part, the little middle part here. Let me quickly annotate on it so that we can uh, see it here. Yes, we are looking at, let me see. Looking at your mission critical assets. In our mission critical assets here, we don't want people to access if it's accounts, if it is results. That is a mission critical asset. We don't want people to tap into it. So we need to ensure that yes, we have, um, yes, we need to ensure that we have our policies because policies help us to prevent and look at the small different items, what your policies should have vulnerability management, penetration testing, I don't know, threat modeling, all these are items we need to focus on. Look at operations for monitoring of these resources. At least one, we told you prevention is better than cure because if we prevent an attack, so much the better, then that way we know we are safe. Monitoring and responses. And that's why we say these integrity checks there. You're an IT manager. You go and test for integrity. Before you sleep, you keep your shot the previous day. When you come in the morning, run an integrity check. 
That is the only way you can know that, aha, at night, we had 15 viruses that were sent to us. They came into the network. And you can be able to take if some of them are actually still even active. Are we together? So you can be able to trace um, this kind of attacks because what will they have broken? Integrity that we packed our system very well. Everything was running well, woke up in the morning and we can now trace and see, okay, this one deleted this, this one edited the other, this one transferred money. However, I told you that is something very important. Every IT expert needs to do. Otherwise, you can't say an IT expert, you go and sleep, you wake up, they'll ask you, what, how did you know that actually they stole money from an account? It's only the integrity test. Okay. Then, of course, for all the others, you need to have network, data security, application security, endpoint security, network security, perimeter security, public cloud security or private cloud security whichever, just to make sure that you keep these um, outside threats away, this kind of draft that are somewhere seated trying to make money without actually working for it. So our aim is to see that we get our system as secure as possible. Okay. These are some of the items that can help us to defend our networks or our systems. We have our data. We need to have data backups. Those are copies saved somewhere. On the cloud, saved away. You really, the, the practice is that keep your backups over 10, minimum 10 kilometers away from your working place. In case a bomb blasts, you should be able to pick backups from a different venue by systems and people are able to start and proceed with their work if they didn't die. User training, monitoring, we've seen them, encryption. You don't want people to um, read information as it is. As it goes, check your emails, even Gmail, by the way, encrypts its information because they want it to be secure and no one wants to have a system that is not encrypted. But just ensure that the whole time your network is fully encrypted. No one can tap in and pick information. You need to have some encryption algorithms. And of course, on the other side, when they pick them, it's decrypted at the server end. Access management, you need to know who accesses what at what level. Are you the academic registrar to view these transcripts and issue them? Are you a lecturer? As a lecturer, my role is only to enter in my results of only my course units that I teach. That's why when I go to my portfolio, I, I, I can only on my user page, I can only see what I have been assigned to teach, not what X teaches, what Y teaches, only mine. I must have updates of all my software, upgrades, antivirus, spam filters, firewalls, and many more defensive mechanisms to ensure that the CIA is really um, protected. Um, let me see, we should soon be winding up. Vulnerabilities and attacks, we've seen them. All those vulnerabilities are those that cause loss of CIA loss of integrity, loss of availability, and loss of confidentiality. If a file has been corrupted, it has been deleted, loss of integrity. It becomes leaky, meaning that you have changed, you have had access to it by different people. That means it is confidentiality. Then we see if it's available or if it's unavailable. That means someone, who, and yet you're an authorized user. Imagine a student tells you, oh, madam, I failed to log in, I can't even enroll into your system, into um, your, the course unit. I'll be like, really? You're a MOOC student, yes. You have a username, password, yes. Did you search for either my name or the course unit or course code and you can't get it? 
Then you say, okay, I think I was using a wrong course code. Use the right course code, IST1305. Um, and of course, we've seen the, the three, the two types of attacks, passive and active. They are added here two more. Either the intruders may be insiders. Actually, they say over 90% of the insiders of every organization are the actual thieves. Outsiders, only 10% access information from outside. But usually it is the intruders inside, the people inside that give this information even to the outsiders. And that's why we do forensic investigation to give us the entire truth. Is it true that someone inside actually is the one that gave it out? And the whole truth will be relieved, will be revealed. How do we countermeasure in terms of how can we help in managing these security attacks? One, we must prevent it. And there are so many tools as we saw under that. Um, let me just take it back briefly here. Look at the issues under prevention. There are so many things you need to consider under prevention because prevention is better than cure of any kind of attacks. Two, detection. You should be in position to detect that, yes, a thief has actually come into the network. You need to see if it is active or if they actually is a post-mortem. They came, did this, went away. The third one, if it happens, you should know always how to recover this information. That's why we shall also look at the data recovery component. We should also know how to hide information. I will also take you through. It's called, it's a whole chapter we look at called steganography. Steganography is the process of hiding these tools. And we shall see how can you hide tools, masquerade these tools such that you send information by the time it arrives, for them, they see something else. When they decode it, it actually, the actual message comes up. So we handle this kind of security threats by preventing them, detecting them. And if the worst comes to worst that yes, they came, did the other, deleted everything, can we recover at least all our systems to their original format? So this may result into new vulnerabilities, or you may even have some residue vulnerabilities. The most important goal here is to minimize the risk of loss. Otherwise, if everything gets lost, everything gets deleted. And that's why we see every expert in IT must know this digital forensics because we are always preventing, detecting, and recovering. That is what our core mission is. Of course, there are different threat consequences. For unauthorized disclosure, you will see that information will be exposed. It even get in two papers. I gave you that example of the MTN boss. When they disclosed his what? The nudes he had taken. Oh my God, it was such a mess. They fired him. Interceptions, interference, intrusions, all this happen when it's under unauthorized disclosure. Deception. You masquerade, falsify information, and you repudiate it, you change it. Disruption, incapacitation, corruption, obstruction. That means you totally distract people. I'll give an example sometimes that when the news is too full of bad, bad things, they will have to come up with something exciting to get, they try to disrupt you, divert your attention from something so that they can now carry out an attack somewhere and handle it later. There is the usurpation. Usurpation is misappropriation or misuse of information. You have correct information. However, you go and explain it and wrongly put it out there. That is usurpation. That is a threat consequence. Of course, our own is to see that for every computer system, we need to pro protect or guard this information. Let us read some of the procedures. One, we need to track who has access to this data. And this must only be accessed by people who are controlled and in a controlled environment. That is the most important thing. Otherwise, if information is accessed by people 
who are coming from an unprotected environment. We don't know them. Anyone can come in, log in. Two. Yes, do you have a question? I hear someone has unmuted. Yes. Matthew. Hello? Yes, go ahead, please. No. I don't, uh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I've understood. Okay, so we're saying, what is the role and scope of computing? These are the key core roles of what we need to do. Number one is to make sure we track who has access to our systems. At any one time we ask you say, oh, these are the users, we have 50 users that can log on. That's why I asked you from the beginning, how many of you have had access and have registered? on the data forensics um, for notes. Videos are already up there. Notes are there. Recordings, copies of them are also there as well. At least the links, username and password. By the way, there is a trick now with the way Zoom has changed. That link, you don't just click it. You follow instructions. It says copy it. You go there, copy it, go and paste it in the web browser then you enter the password. That is how you're able to have access to the recording. Who has access to this information? Number two, the guards. Access to computer facilities. That's how we ask, do you have um, fingerprint? Did you use? That is the part of computer security. Did you have the keys? How many copies? And that's why you see mainly for some of those places, they are always electronic, you don't want to start having people making copies of keys. People now open doors, even look at houses, even gates, people are moving to more automation. Three, the data must be transmitted securely. Look at that number three, from an, any internet place. And what do we use there? Encryption, the message you're going to send, you must encrypt it so that it's only the rightful user that should decrypt it. Four, sensitive files must be secure and no one should have access to them because you've classified your files. These ones are for general people, this one, but this one concerning results, transcripts, money files, please keep this away from the public. They are very sensitive about an organization's financial health. Okay. Um, as we wind up, we want to look at some of the security functional requirements. Because remember, in system analysis and design, we said that we have um, functional requirements and non-functional requirements. Now, non-functional requirements are where we classify security. All those saying that information must be confidential, it must have these other non-functional um, requirements. So these security requirements include access control, who has access to the premises, identification or and authentication, communication protection, system and information integrity. These are part of the technical measures of our requirements. Then of course, at management and control level, you should be able to track awareness and training. Who has done training? How many people did that awareness training? Especially when you're new in an organization, part of orientation, when a new policy comes up, then of course, carrying out an audit, carrying out accountability, carrying out the certification, accreditation, security assessment, contingency planning, having plan Bs, maintenance, physical and environmental protection, planning and personal security, personnel security, risk assessment. All these are ways in which management can carry out controls for having a good secure environment. Overlapping technical and management, yes, this configuration management, incidents response and media protection because these cut across technical as well as management. So at any one time, as an IT um, digital expert or computer forensic expert, this is part of your work, part and parcel, to ensure that policies are there, access control policies are there, 
all these that are confidential are all ranked. Not everyone can just log in and view everything. Otherwise, I told you even internal people, you can't trust the 90%. People come into an organization to work with a wrong motive. Their motive is to see how can they go and steal information, take it to, um, take it to different people outside there. And of course, that one will tarnish the image of an organization. As we wind up, we have different security architectures and they have standards. The standard for OSI architecture is X800. This is just a number that specifies what every network should have. What do they do? They have a systematic way of defining requirements for security and characterizing approaches for satisfying them. Security attacks, how do you have compromised security? Security mechanisms that you should put in place. How do you detect? How do you prevent? How do you recover from an attack? Security services, counter security attacks. How do you counter attacks from them? Those are part of the procedures. And as I told you, it is mandatory because of what IEEE and ISO, International Standards Organization says that for any organization that has any IT gadgets, any IT running there, any networks, you're accessing internet, you must have these forensic audits. You must have these security minimums there. And here are some, it's just a general taxonomy that gives us a list of who are potential attackers? We can have hackers, spies, terrorists are part of attackers, corporate riders, um, professional criminals, vandalers, vo vo voyagers. Voyagers are those who are travelers. They're on, they're passing by. The passive attackers, they pick information and they see how this information can um, be used, of course, to counter the attack. In tools that they can use, there are several tools in attacking the physical attacks, information exchange, user commands for scripting or programming, autonomous agents, toolkits, distributed tools, data taps. There are several tools. Vulnerabilities at what levels? At design, at implementation, at configuration. You need to know at what levels of attacks. What actions can be done? You need to probe that investigation. You need to scan. You need to carry out floods. Authentication. You need to look at bypasses, the spoofs, read, copy. These are part of activities on what one can do to a particular file. Those who have stolen, you should be able to track. Those who have modified, deleted. Otherwise, if you can't track this on an event, I told you it is worse that someone comes to your house, picks something. You don't even detect that actually a thief came and picked a whole TV. Ah, that means someone is very careless. What do they mainly target? Accounts, processes, data, components, computers, networks, internetworks. Unauthorized results include increased access. You'll just see, we used to have five people logging in, but you'll see all oh, 15 people, 30 people now are logging in. How? Who gave them access? Disclosure of information, corruption of information, denial of services, theft of resources, our objective is to ensure that any kind of challenge, the status, the thrill for political gain, these, in objective, these are the objectives as to why these attackers carry out these attacks. They, some, some of them are white hackers. White hackers are those who just want to use it as for study purposes. You're not a thief. You're just trying to see, can I manage to tap, just like this one said, oh, a friend of his in Imbarara was able to tap into, tap into a particular system. Those are just, it's a challenge. 
change your status. Oh, I did this and you start bragging. White hackers. There are some who do it for money, financial gain, others do it for political gain. You're on so-and-so's group, let us see how we can tarnish the other group. Others just do it for damage. Let us just go and damage that organization's software and hardware. You attack and carry out all kinds of attacks on security of all the information uh, systems. These are the trends and there are so many attacks. Look at them, so many, but look at how they've kept growing over time from 1990 to 2001. And remember in the previous slides that even covered, there are more recent ones, but we see that what is on the increase is denial of service. Denial of service struck and see when it did come into place and the kind of tools. 1998 is when people began doing a lot of denial of service. The next slide is about money, which ones usually make a lot of loss. Viruses, you, a uh, study which was done by FBI in 2006 found that they had the highest losses. Today, and I will encourage you, please go to Uganda police forces. Every year, they release a report for the previous year. The current report that is there is for the year 2000. You will see the most recent trends of crimes that people have. And you'll see, though, my God, the, tr the trucks are very serious, the threats. I was reviewing it some time back with the team, and we saw that one of them now made the biggest loss, financial loss to the individuals was money. And what money? Money was stolen over banks, Stanbeek, Bank of Africa, I don't know. Many banks lost billions of money. Eh? All these are different types of different crimes. And of course, annually, you must report. Don't say, oh, they stole this, let me just keep quiet. No, look at the technologies that are most used. Firewalls had the highest when FBI was doing the attack, the system, a security survey in 2006. Antivirus software were the next ones. Anti-spyware, that people were the most secure components they were using. Server-based access control lists, intrusion detection systems, encryption of data in transit and data that is stored is encrypted. Reuse of access um, of accounts, they stop those passwords. I told you every week or every month, change password, change password, never use it. Part of the security rules. Intrusion prevention, log management software, tracing, it's like a register. From the morning, if you write down, what did you do from morning till evening? That is your register of activities. Same applies to a network. You should be able to have our log management software, which tracks who does what at what particular time. So when you're coming to do a forensic, that's why you start doing your postmortem from. Application level firewalls, smart cards, one-time password tokens, forensic tools, public infrastructure, infrastructure, excuse me, specialized wireless security systems, endpoint security client software, biometrics, and many others. Security is really on the increase. And of course, here yeah, we said part of the policies are important as part of the strategies. If you don't have a policy, this policy is what defines what's secure, what is not secure. It codifies what the policy should allow us to do the do's and don'ts and procedures. In case we find you watching pornography, unaccepted, it is criminal, it's not needed, it's not, they can take you on until you lose your job. Once they do a forensic on you. So do not, because I told you people who do watch pornography, people who are always playing games, are part of those who expose the network of an organization. You're exposing it to hackers, to all kinds of threats to come in and disorganize the system. At implementation level, how does it do it? Prevention, detection, response. You must have all your tools available at any one time and you should be able to keep tracking as we're going to see shortly using our reg shot to see how can we have access to um, 
how can we have access to tracing that yes, integrity has actually been violated. In summary, this is what we've been able to look at under our components of security, then we'll proceed on uh, next week with um, the acquisition phase step by step as we look at our tools one by one. Okay, yes, I mentioned to us that uh, we have a tool that we use to ensure uh, integrity. So integrity is one of those that are very, very, very key. And we said it's the responsibility of an organization to track and to trace that yes, um, a system is now integrity safe. Okay, so I will just shortly share a screen that will capture for us um, how do we maintain and test um, our so integrity? Have, uh, this we are going to, and just a moment. So I just want to take you through um, a series of uh, digital forensic and criminal uh, investigation uh, tutorial that we will be using throughout. It's also going to be recorded so you can be able to still practice it as we go on. So we'll be doing bit by bit. I will show you how we can do it on our own. Okay, so let me share my screen again. So for that purpose, we have to download the software called RedShot to maintain my integrity of the system. Can you hear the volume? Can you hear what this person is saying? Hello? Yeah, the voice is still low. The voice is low. The volume is, uh, the volume is quite low. At maximum. Let me just go from the beginning. Hello, everyone. In this tutorial, we are going to learn about the registry analysis. So for that purpose, we have to download the software called RedShot to maintain the integrity of the system. Let's open the browser and search for RedShot. Okay, so in order to test for integrity, I gave an example what integrity means. Integrity means that you left your system safe, you come back the next day, you want to check if something went missing, the current status has been modified, some deletions took place. That is why we actually want to do, or that is why we want to carry out this. And the tool we use is called Reg Short. So what they're saying, we go to Google. Um, let me just open Google over here. Can you see my screen? Are you able to see that I've gone to Google? Yes. You type in RegShot, R-E-G-S-H-O-T. So this RegShot will give us um, different, it's one tool, it's a very small tool that you install and you keep track of what you have. So it's under RegShot, you'll pick it, of course, it's for Windows. Now, if you're using a Linux machine, you will use Linux. If you're using whatever operating system, they work, there are different versions for them. We pick it under the first one, under sourceforge.net, RegShot download. So we click there and we click download. Just look at the downloads, just only this week, 2,343. That gives you an indication that, you know, there are so many people in forensics that are forever downloading and using this kind of tool. So if we download it, we want to save it somewhere, usually, would want to save it maybe on the desktop. It's a very small uh, software. Tracing it yet has gone to my downloads. So I want to follow it through uh, 
and ensure that I, it's zipped, it's WinRAD, it's zipped. I want to unzip it. I don't know. Um, let me find out from you, class, how many of you actually have your computers? By a show of hand, Steady, do you have your computer there with you? Alex, a team, Babirie, Emma, Emmanuel, Aaron. Okay, Teddy says she has her laptop there with her. Do you have internet? Please kindly download. You have internet. Kindly download this tool. As you download it, mine has downloaded because I'll just take it in the next few minutes and I'll be done. That's why I'm trying to buy uh, some time. A team is saying she doesn't have hers, but I will advise you please practice. Because as I told you, you can't show your competent in digital forensics without going step by step. And we have about 10 tools, 10 tutorials we are going to go through. So you badly need to keep track of this as well. Georgia will encourage you, please. Um, the next time you have class, please uh, sit where you can easily download a phone. No, don't download for a phone. Focus on a laptop or a computer. OK, so let me first take us back to the forensics. Um, so I want to fast track it a little bit. So it is regshot, the first one, under sourceforge.net. You should be able to download it as we did. This is the same screenshot we had. So you click download. Look at that week. That week for him, it was 2,100. That was sometime last year. So it will start downloading. And of course, it's advisable for us to drag it onto okay. the desktop. Five. So this is where they okay. saved it. And I guess it has to be Open. Let me cut and paste it on the desktop. Okay, let me first mute here so that we get ourselves up to speed. Um, I'll want to go to my downloads, pick it. Uh, I control exit because I want to put it on the desktop. Um, let me see. And create a folder. Sometimes I have a folder here I've called RegShot Forensics. Uh, for consistency, I would still want to put it in within the same folder. So if it is win zipped, you right click it and open it, right click. My right click really takes a little longer than expected. Cause I found I had so many viruses. I don't know. Out of the 900 MBs, uh, GBs, I think I've used already nearly half, 460. So it's quite slow, but I imagine yours um a little fast ah it's taking longer let me find out <laughs> uh georgia is asking madam when is the test yeah no, we, we've not yet covered much hmm, we're running to our test maybe around fourth week yes around fourth week because this is second week so okay we've seen um, I don't know, it's taking longer. I'll still want to, um, let me see how to get out of this because it's taking longer than expected. We go through our tutorial again. Okay. 
So the extraction has been done on the desktop. So here is the extracted. So that is the folder that they're opening. So inside, inside that folder, you will look out for one called reg short and see, um, depending on the specifications again of your machine. How do we pick the, how, how do you get to find out your specifications? You got to right click your hard disk and you're able to see the properties or even of my computer, you should be able to see the specifications of the operating system and also the capacity of the RAM so that you're picking specifically for your uh, kind of computer so that you don't have compatibility issues. And one of the things he mentions is the level, um, the level of the newness of the version of Windows that you have. If it's a very, very old versions, RegShot may not work on it. There may be other tools that are actually there for free. RegShot is a free tool that we will use to carry out our integrity test. I'm very keen um, on going to the desktop and following through that particular slide so that we can have something um, to be able to deal with. Let me still look at, okay. So, let me share with you my screen so that you see what I'm seeing. So this is my folder. This is my unzipped folder that... Um, the screen is not, not yet. It's not yet shared. Eh? Okay, have you seen it now? Um, no, not yet. Hmm. It's coming, it's loading. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you see in within it, it has so many other tools. The last four tools are those that you can use. However, you need to know the specs that you have. In my case, so the most common one that we have, it's either an X86, those are the old ones. The new ones are X64s, ANSYs. So I will double click the reg short x64 ansi.exe so this file is what i will download it will ask me if i want to allow i proceed on yet and so that are you seeing my little screen that i have that is the one he also had on his tutorial are we there because you're going to do this and practice it and please you must have some machines with you much as we come for our face-to-face -face tutorials and we go through all these 10 that we're going to cover, please, you must have at least a computer. If you can't have one, you will share with a neighbor to be able to view because this is what is expected for you, from you when you're doing a forensic integrity test. So we want to test just the integrity of our system. We usually select the plain.txt the text to give us the kind of output of the report we have. So the first thing we do, we click first shot. So in taking the first shot, it's running. You can see the keys are running at the bottom. And so it's going to create some output that I need to save somewhere. And I will save it in that same folder for reg, reg shots, and I want to call it a name so that we keep that version in a particular place. Then I will make some changes to the system to see, can it be able to trace that, okay, I did something, that is what I will do. If it traces that, that means I, I have, it has been able to track when I compare previously what the system was and now after I have deleted something, it will now, I'll click compare. When I click compare, then it will be able to check the current one with what I previously had in the first shot and notice that yes, there is a change and it will give us a whole report. So that is the report that I will submit to management. That's the report I will write and explain and say attached is our integrity checked report. And you will see 
the file path even indicated. You deleted something from here, 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 here. This one was edited, this one, whatever was done. And that's why we said every evening before you go, make a shot, save it. The next morning you come, run your reg shot, just to trace and see, can you detect whether an intruder came into the system? That is all um, we are doing. Oh, I see it's taking a little bit longer, but we will be patient. For those whose first shot is running, do you already have it running? Okay, as it does that, I'll want to still go back and share with you our tutorial. Okay, it has finished. I hear it saying that it has finished. Let me share and see what it shows. Okay, so it's showing that yes, a first one was picked. I want to see, okay, the output path, where did it go to is very important because I will not, and that's why if I want to trace where it is, I should tell it where to go and save it. Let me pick and see, okay, it has saved it under temporary files, very dangerous. Very dangerous, otherwise I should have told it, you know, go and first of all, save it on my desktop save it on the desktop um save it in a folder let me save it just on the desktop okay now that is for my second one there is shoot and save so that you can well, as you're going to shoot but i let me first cancel because I haven't yet done any changes to my system. So I'll go and open up any folder. Maybe I can even go to downloads, but you want to go to somewhere you can easily trace. And I go, um, let me just go to the desktop. Um, any particular file I can just find and say, ah, oh, that one is okay. I don't mind losing it. Let me go to the desktop. I go to digital forensics investigation. Um, maybe PowerPoint slides, okay. And I say, it's okay. I don't mind losing this one because I had already, uh, I have different versions of it anyway. That was for chapter one. So I just want to go and quickly delete it so that it's out of the system because I'm trying to show you that the first system, when I took the first shot, that is the report I had as shot one. When I do a system and I click shot two, it is now comparing, have I made any changes between shot one and shot two? The difference is that we are saying that can be done in two different days. Yesterday, before I went home, I do a shot one. The next day I come in the morning, I do shot two, just to see if I've detected any integrity that was um, carried out. Oh, I need to be a little more patient because this, my mouse keeps disappointing me. Okay, so I tell it delete. So my folder under digital forensic investigation, PPT notes, is now empty. Okay, so I want to share my screen of my reg shot. So now I tell it to take a second shot and to save it. Because I now want to see, I'm waiting for the output. So after it has shared those two, then the third component will be available, which is compare. So now I should be able then to then compare and just see what is happening. Let me stop sharing and get back to our tutorial so that we don't miss out um, on that part. Okay, so here he's looking for the path where he saved it. On the desktop, 
or you can just put it in that particular folder you call drag shot so that you can have access to tracing it. So all he's just explaining is looking out for those changes. So he wants to do that to test and how do you maintain integrity? Okay, so he has saved short one somewhere on the desktop so that he can easily trace it. Then he's now going to do some changes, go delete something, edit something, hide some file somewhere. That is if an attacker comes in and does it. He opens some strange folder he had there on his desktop, picks some notes somewhere. And you'll see his aim is to see that he focuses on deleting at least something meaning that you will have modified, you'll have carried out a modification of the system. He has seen some PowerPoint slides. He just highlights them and he deletes them. So he has deleted them. So he takes a second shot. So he's just making sure that he goes to his directory in under drive, folder extensions, okay. he hides them so, just to ensure that yes, they are hidden, they are somewhere, but he has hidden them. Second Imagine shot. if that's what a hacker has come in and checked, he takes a second shot, shoot and save. So it is the running. What he's saying is that, you know, the olden systems of Windows have a problem with running break shots. So you have to get the exact version for your machine. So his second shot is done and he clicks compare. So that is the output of the comparison where he's able to see that, yes, six files so far have been um, deleted. And of course, see all the HTMLs and all the details there, hexadecimal readings at the bottom. Check there. So the checkbox 
check box has to be unchecked the height file extension okay view yes it is unchecked now so this is a simple application with one goal in mind to show that what changes have happened in windows registry thank you the process used to maintain the document okay so i don't know how many of us have been able to follow through and try to see mine is still checking for the comparison it's comparing reg one and uh the short one and the second shot so it is checking for that so it's that kind of output report and by the words we read and we noted that all these steps must be fully documented document and document these steps very very important otherwise when you go to the courts of law they will ask you questions how did you do this how did you do the other so you need to document and who gave you the standards what tools who defines them as being part of the digital forensic tool so there are so many tools by the way i will not tell you it's only one tool it's only no there are so many tools that you can use so we'll just only use part and some of these free open source um tools okay class i'm very keen on leaving you it's 15 past seven thank you very much um we can maintain our class also from next week five to five to seven is okay um i was able to get my schedule out because i know as the five weeks end we need to have something sustainable because you're an evening class and you need to equally be able to study do we have any questions excuse me madam yes please thank you uh i tried more and they asked me for the enrollment key i don't know whether you have already shared it We are not listening, Madam. Anything? We are not here yet. Anything? I'm logging on on Tumuwele. Are you seeing my screen? Um, on my screen, let me just minimize this. On my screen, I can be able to see my courses that I do have. And here is um, digital forensic investigation. I'm only seeing my only uh, my three courses that I have online: system analysis and design, um, digital forensics, and for masters as well. Okay, so this is my platform. I want to enable um, my editing on. You can already see my questions. My test is already set. I'm only waiting for the right full time. I go and enable it immediately. Okay, so the rightful notes are all uploaded. All your chapters are there. Okay, so I want to go and check for my key, the enrollment key. Because I remember we put it as we specified it as uh, our course code, but we just want to be sure. We just want to be sure, let me see. Even if I used the course code and worked out. It has to be the course code. Why should we take it so far away from the course code?
Okay. So I just want to check and see. That's it in capital letters. Can you all see it? IST 3105. So if I'm to edit it, I would edit it. I don't want to. So please kindly take note. It's IST 3105. Capital I, capital S, capital T. No space in between, please. Thank you, doctor. Um, let me just go and check and see. Now, where I say that she has um, enrolled, let me check and see. And uh, all let me see. those who have enrolled with N. She's just done with comparing, not with enrollment. I don't know. Now, where I was just meaning she's done with comparing, not enrollment. Okay. Now, uh... so you, you check, uh, check with me, Kamujisha, with K, because for me, I enrolled. Kamujisha. K. Uh, Kamujisha, yes. Yes. Is it this? Okay, the son name. Uh, Kamujisha, K, son name. So under K, uh, let me see. I see Wally Kenneth has enrolled, he enrolled six hours ago. Active is a status. One participant. Let me see what if you, they have it as your first letter. Hey, hey, okay, Matia, if we go to M and we see. Do you hey, see Matia. it? Eh? You can see Samjisha Matia. Yes. Matia ah, does yes. Samjisha at student something, something. Okay. Status. Yes. Okay. Mm. So I can be able to also view all of them that I enrolled. Mm. I can view all. Um, all that have enrolled on to digital forensics. I'm not making any changes. So, and I've left it open. Otherwise, hey, wow. We have 52 users. Um, Okay, so at least I've seen 52, but I need to um, check and see because, okay. So let me hear from Nawera. Okay. Okay, Nawera, you were able to do your comparison. So on doing the comparison and the outputs, I don't know if you're able to interpret your outputs. Your outputs show you how many files were deleted. And that's the beginning of what are you going to recover? Remember we said whenever you're making your report and request to police, you must have evidence. You don't wake up and say, oh, I think actually we had an attack. No, what is the evidence that you were attacked? It is only this reg short test of integrity that will be able to show you that yes, something happened. From the time I left it, see the evidence, even the date is there. This one at this time, in between that time, something happened and it traces what happened. And that's the beginning of why you need to do the forensics. Class with that, I would want to rest my case for today and encourage those who have missed today's class that Friday two to four, we will have the similar session with the day <clears throat> class. So have yourselves a nice evening and may God bless uh, you. Doctor. Uh, do doctor, uh, is this is, is it, has this our, been our first lecture? Second, with we you. the first one. Oh my God! I can't miss a, a week because you know we only have ten weeks of class. 
and two weeks uh, of exams. So we uh, have about ten chapters. About, uh, 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 when, we, when is the deadline for submit that uh, first assignment? Today. Uh oh. The most I can add you are only up to Friday. Okay, thank you, Doctor. By Friday midday and send to my email. Okay. At cit.sc.ug. Okay. Okay, have a nice evening class. Thank you. Thank you. I'll share the recording link as well.